I, I came today and I didn't have a coat. So I, I went back to the axe room, got myself a coat. There's clothes back there, guys. There's there's jackets back there. There's coats back there. There's suits back there. And today we have a shipment of 30, 30 boxes of stuff from an estate that was closed. And John, a uh, guy who used to attend Tata Fellowship, his parents' estate was closed. And there's like boxes and boxes and boxes of things coming today. Um, and so we'll we'll put them out, and then uh, there's several people who are volunteered to help with that. Um, and then next week, uh, it's Christmas Eve, there'll be tons of clothes. So come early, so you can go through those. And they're nice clothes too. I I've seen some of the things that he he puts out. Uh, secondly, I want to just say, um, several weeks ago, I I had uh, several weeks, several messages ago. This is months ago. I said. Use your paper Bible because you just don't know what's going on electronically all the time, especially with AI going on and people trying to change the, uh, what the word says. But I've made a commitment to bring my paper Bible to church uh, every Sunday and put my phone away. It has been such a blessing. It really has. The distractions, I, I used to catch myself going on to different social medias while in church and having a stop and no more of that. It's, I put my phone away. Let me suggest that that you aim to, to do that because it, it helps you focus so much more. Anyway, that's my confession for the day. Today we're, we're in Isaiah 49. Last week we we're in Isaiah 40 with Barnabas. Next week uh, uh, Scott is going to preach. And then uh, after Christmas, uh, Federico is going to close out our, our, our series in Isaiah. To start today, um, I want to start with by, by doing this. I want to start by going to what Barnabas preached last week. Um, in Isaiah 40, he says, it says, starts with comfort. Yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Israel and cry out. And then at the end of our section today, verse 13, it says this. It says, for the Lord has comforted his people. And I don't think want to make too big a deal out of this because I don't think it's just, this is you know a bookends of a bigger message or anything. But the point is, God called Isaiah to comfort his people. And here... God saying, the Lord has comforted. And our passage today is showing where that comfort comes from. And so we're going to look at Isaiah 49. Um, I should probably pull out the this thing here. And we're going to look at Isaiah 49. And it's the mission of the servant. The mission of the servant. This is the second of what has been called the the servant. Um, oh, what are they called? Servant songs in Isaiah. Uh, they, they kind of some people dispute calling them that because actually throughout the book of Isaiah the servant is mentioned. But these are four sections where it's it's almost like a psalm. In fact, when I first read it, I, I wrote that in the notes. I said, this reads like a psalm of David. Um, in this The servant song we're looking at today, verse 49, uh, is, talks about um, Jesus' mission or the mission of the servant. And I call it phase two. And you'll see what I'm talking about later. So this is the mission of the servant, phase two. Throughout Scripture, the servant of the Lord is people called servant of the Lord. Um, uh, the patriarchs were called servants of the Lord, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, or Israel. They were specifically called servant of the Lord. Moses, a servant of the Lord. Leaders like Joshua and, and Samson, Solomon, and prophets. It's, throughout the whole Bible, the term servant of the Lord is used. 
in the New Testament, um, Mary is called servant of the Lord, and Simeon, Paul, James, Simon, Peter, Jude, and John, among others, they're called the servant of the Lord. We're, they're servants of the Lord. Groups, even groups are called the servant of the Lord. Uh, the, uh, Israel is called the servant of the Lord. We'll see that even here. Uh, the priests, uh, prophets as a group, even nations were called servants of the Lord. Even non-Christians, even pagan, um, um, what's his name? Cyrus. Uh, and, um, uh, wow, why is his name even? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, thank you. Nebuchadnezzar, they're called servants of the Lord. So the, the term servant of the Lord isn't unique. Jesus, uh, we're called, we are servants of the Lord as Christians. If you're a believer in Christ, that's one of your identities. It's your servant of the Lord. So today in chapter 49, we're going to look at the servant of the Lord. And if, if uh, summarizing it, this is kind of uh, how I would summarize. The servant brings comfort to God's people and brings glory to God by being a light in the world by being God's covenant for the world, and by being salvation to the world. Probably should stay away from those. Um, the servant brings comfort to God's people and brings glory to God by being a light in the world, by being God's covenant for the world, and by being salvation to the world. And here's kind of the flow of the passage. It goes from the servant inviting the world to come, and then he describes himself, and then God says, here's your, here's your initial mission. And the servant says, well, I've failed. After that, God introduces kind of phase two of his plan. He presents the servant's three-pronged mission. I call it three-pronged. Other people might argue with that, but that's how I'm preaching it today. Um, and then ultimately the whole earth will be redeemed and then God's people will be able to declare that God has given us comfort. Join me in prayer. Father God, I, I pray your spirit speaks today. Um, I pray your word comes out uh, strong and clear. I pray that uh, it convicts uh, that it uh, it cuts between bone and marrow so that we are convicted and challenged and drawn to the servant. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna, I'm not going to read the whole thing. We're going to read sections and go through it and sections and go through it. Um, and But we're going to hit heavy the servant's phase two of his mission. So it says, listen, O coastlands, to me. And take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. a lot there so first he addresses he says listen O coastlands to me and if we look back in the o Co the coastlands are mentioned a couple of times um uh verse 5 41 says well actually start with the beginning of verse 41 it says keep silent before me O coastlands i don't want to hear from you keep silent it's not your time then he says in verse 5, it says, the coastline saw it and fear. So now they're onlookers. And then we're here in 49, he's inviting the people from the coastlands to come in, to join in. And it says, for you people from afar, he's talking about Gentile nations, the people outside of Israel. This uh, passage is written not to the Jews as the main uh, recipients. It's written to the Gentiles. It's written, written to us. 
He calls people beyond the shores from afar, from afar from Israel. It makes me think of like the Great Commission where he says to the ends of the earth. He's calling the ends of the earth. So he's calling them. And immediately we, we see 49, there's a shift. Because up until this point, verse 48, he's, he's preaching judgment and comfort, judgment and comfort to Israel. And now he shifts to the nations. Okay, then then he 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 says that he, the speaker, will be born of a woman. He will be called out of the womb. The servant that is t- talking here will be born into this world, and, and we soon celebrate that birth. Um, I think it's pretty clear, even from the very get-go, who's speaking here? It's Jesus. Jesus is speaking through through Isaiah, through Isaiah's pen, and he's, he's well, you, we'll see what he's doing. And then he says that God will declare his name before he is born. God will name him before he is born. While he was in the matrix of his mother, God declared his name. When the angel announced the birth of Jesus, he also declared what his name would be. He goes to, he's in Joseph, in Matthew one twenty one. he says, uh, your wife will bring forth a son and you shall call his name. I'm sorry, this was a declaration of, uh, of uh, yeah. Uh, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from his sins. So his name was declared before he was born, while he was in his matrix of his mother. And so we're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the birth of Jesus. But it's not just his birth. Here's the prophecy of the birth of the servant. But there's also the prophecy of the warrior servant. As he comes back, and I'll tie this to later. Look, it says that his a sharp sword will be coming out of his mouth. It gives a very uh, in, in Revelation nineteen fifteen. There's a very vivid description of Jesus coming, and out of his mouth the sharp sword, with which he will strike down the nations, and he will rule with an iron scepter. So we see here the both comings of Jesus Christ. He comes as a baby. And he comes as a judge and a ruler. Then what's this about him being hidden initially? When Jesus came to earth, it took him 30 years to step out on the stage. He grew for 30 years before he stepped out. In fact, remember when he went to the the, the wedding in Canaan and uh, there was this problem. They were out of out of wine, and uh, Mary, his mother, said, "He'll take care of it. Jesus will take care of it." And Jesus says, "It's not my time yet. I'm not to declare myself yet. I still need to remain hidden." But of course, as a good Jewish boy, he did what his mother told him to do, and he he helped out. Um, then there's there's multiple times where Jesus had mercy on people. He would heal them, and then he told them to. Keep quiet. Don't go spreading it around. And of course, people listen to him, right? No, they went out and they spread it. And then finally, in the beginning, opening couple, uh, the opening verse here, we have, it says that he's a polished arrow. Uh, What's that imagery talking about? That imagery is talking about his servanthood. An arrow doesn't, have a mind of its own, doesn't go where it wants to go. It just serves the archer. It it goes where the archer points it. It hits the target the archer uh, wants it to hit. In Philippians 2.6, it says that Jesus, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a servant 
and coming in the likeness of men. Jesus was the perfect servant. He was. He came to earth as a baby. He was um, just the right time God brought him forth to the world. Continuing, it says, And he said to me, You are my servant, O Israel. But wait a minute, Lee. You've just been saying that this is Jesus here. And here it says, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. The, the, the term, I t- said the term servant of the Lord has, is kind of has this, this long um, swath throughout the scripture. And the patriarchs and the prophets were all servants of the Lord. And then the nation of Israel was a servant of the Lord. And, and then through Israel came the servant, Jesus. Um, I, I think this is, now, just to, okay, to be truthful, there's a lot of passages in, in Isaiah that there's a, people who come at it from different sides, from different angles. I choose to take this from a poetic, more of a poetic angle. Um, and I think what he's saying is that he's, he's saying, saying, Jesus, Israel was my servant, and you've come from Israel. But what's interesting here is that Jesus says, in, res- in response to this, says, then I say, I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Israel was God's people from when they, well, from before uh, they went into uh, Egypt, but as they came out of Egypt, they they became God's nation, and God dwelt with them in the tabernacle. He he ministered to them. He worked with them, and all he got was a hand in the face. He, they rejected him. Finally, he brings the Savior, this servant, to to Israel, and again, a hand he says, "We're not interested." And so the response here is then I failed. I failed because Israel didn't respond. Yet, he says, surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work is with God. So basically he's saying, I've worked, but my God, my father is the one who I'm working for. It made me think of the the story. You know the the story of the the Greek god who was cursed to push the rock up the hill and it keeps rolling, falling back on him. I forget his name, uh, but it made me think of the Christianized version of that story, where God tells the guy, tells him, uh, push this rock, and the man pushes this rock and pushes the rock and pushes the rock, but he just can't get it to move. Um, and then finally, Jesus comes, or finally, God comes back. And says, you've done well. Well done. He says, why? I haven't moved the rock. He says, I didn't want you to move the rock. I just said, push the rock. And so he was faithful in what God told him to do. Jesus is faithful. We, we need to be faithful in what God has told us to do. Despite what we see in response of our, our our actions, as long as our actions line up to what God tells us to do, we need to be faithful. Um, and this was his mission to Israel. He says, and now the Lord says, this is this is kind of confusing, but if you just take the word says and move it down, it says now, and now the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant to bring uh, Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him, says. So that's his mission. Was His mission to uh, Israel was to bring Jacob back to him, was to bring to gather Israel back in, and that's the mission that seems to have failed. 
but has it really? Has it really? Then there's this parenthetical statement about how uh, God will give him glory, that his strength shall be in God. But then anyway, he starts saying, the Lord says this, but then it's not until verse 6 that he actually says what the Lord says. says, Indeed, he says, and this is phase 2. Here's phase 2. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to to him who man despises, to him who whom the nations abhors to the servant rulers, kings, kings shall see and arise, princes shall worship. This is what I call the his threefold ministry. This is phase two of the the story. See, Jesus wasn't a afterthought. It wasn't a, oops, Israel rejected me. Now what do I do? Oh, I got it. Let's let's send Jesus and let's let's restore this whole thing. Now, it, Jesus was the goal in the first place. Jesus was the purpose that G, that uh, God chose Israel. Jesus was has always been the goal. And the goal has always been mankind, not just Israel. Goal has always been mankind, not just Israel. So it's threefold. I want to look at these three missions that I see here. Did I jump ahead? Oh, I did. This is um, continuing on. So here's this threefold mission it starts. It says that king shall see and arise, princes shall worship. It says, because the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, he has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in the acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages that you may say to the prisoners, go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourself. And so those are the three missions I see right there. First of all, to be a light to the Gentiles. Second of all, to be salvation to the ends of the earth. And then thirdly, to be a covenant to the people to restore the earth. Let's look at those three. First of all, he's a light to the Gentiles. John 8, 8, 12 says, I will also make you the light of the Gentiles. John 8, 12 says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus came as a light in the world. In Acts 26, 23, it says, Christ must suffer And that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people, the Jews, and the Gentiles. Jesus is the light in this dark world. You ever look around and think, what an awful place we live in. What an awful place we live in. People killing people and suffering happening all over the place. Jesus is the only light. In this darkness, the light of Jesus helps us to see the world for and the spiritual world for what it is. The light of Jesus is the only light we need. If you're if a person is physically blind yet he has the light of Jesus, he can see better than the person who has good eyes but doesn't know Jesus. There's a clarity that comes when you know Jesus. There's an understanding of existence that comes when you know Jesus, that before I knew Jesus, 
I saw the world differently. My eyes were not open. There's a there's a an experience that happens when Jesus enlightens your heart and your mind and comes dwells with you that that uh, gives you a whole new perspective on life and on this the an existence. When I first became a Christian, one of one of the declarations I made to the guy who was discipling me was was it's like I see the world completely different now. And it's true. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, um, Plato's enlightenment, the guy in the cave, he turns around and says, oh, wow, look, you know, there's so much more to life than our pagan world. And it's only through the light of Jesus can we see that. What's interesting is that Paul quotes Isaiah 49, and he applies it to his ministry of evangelizing the world to the end of the earth. Um, he says, we who are in the light have the ministry of sharing and showing his light. Or he doesn't say, this is what I'm saying. Um, how many of you are saying, this little light of mine, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Um, and that's our calling as Christians. We're to shine his light. Then he says that his sal- he is that he is a salvation. Take sorry, let me say this again. That you should take my salvation to the ends of the earth. Uh, John fourteen six says Jesus, that Jesus said to him, "I am the way, the truth." In the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one has salvation except through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the way to the Father, which he fulfills the Old Testament symbols. Jesus is the only way to God. He alone can provide access to God. He is the only way. Jesus is the truth. He fulfills the teachings of the Old Testament and reveals the true God. Also, Jesus alone gives life to those who uh, who who accept him. Jesus alone is the life who fulfills the Old Testament promises of life given by God. He himself, there's life in him. He is the giver of life. And he is able to give eternal life to all those who believe in him. The birth of Jesus transformed our world. All of a sudden, we have God, very God, living amongst us. Life itself in in existence as a person. Life itself. And then he says, I'll make you a covenant to the people to restore the earth. I'll make you a covenant of the people to restore the earth. This is the ultimate goal. It's the restoration of the earth. The new covenant is a promise that God makes with mankind that he will forgive sin and restore or communion with those whose hearts believe in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the mediator of this covenant, and he is the this covenant incarnate. Through him, there's a promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred, Jesus Christ, that death re- can redeem the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Our sins are redeemed by the second covenant. Our sins are redeemed by the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He he died. 
like as you say, he died sealing the covenant, and then he was ro- rose again to show that he defeated death. Ultimately, under the new covenant, God's going to restore the earth. That's what it says right here. That's part of his mission. From And then from the middle of verse 8 of Isaiah 49 through verse 12, we have a prophetic description of what this restored earth is going to look like, what's going to happen. Basically, you can take it metaphorically or you can take it real for you know uh, literally because God's going to restore the whole earth. He's going to recreate that new heavens and new earth. In in Isaiah, he talks about making every making the paths all level. You can talk. It talks about bringing down the hills and rising up the 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 valleys, making it all level. You can take it metaphorically, like I said, saying all troubles and pits are going to be gone. But I want to look at Revelation twenty one. Revelation 21, to me, is the most exciting chapter in the entire Bible. Because Revelation 21 is our destination. Don't tell me, don't ask me, what's heaven going to be like? I care less about what heaven's going to be like than what my eternal destination is going to be like. Because our eternal destination is not heaven. Let me say that again. Our eternal destination is not heaven. Our eternal destination is here on earth. And I've said this before, that heaven is... Our mindset shouldn't be a place. Our mindset shouldn't be, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to have uh, to uh, uh, the eternal earth. Our 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 mindset should be who we're going to be with. Our mindset should be I'm going to be with Jesus. I don't care where I am, as long as I'm with Jesus, because He is the very definition of our life. Let me read a few passages out of here, and I would highly encourage you to spend some time in Revelation 21 and 22. So Revelation 21 says, and I don't have a slide for this. You just have to follow along. Revelation 21 uh, says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them and obey. I mean, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things has passed away. Amen. Amen. It says, I am the Alpha and Omega. So that's Jesus talking. In verse 22, I mean, in chapter 22, there's this, uh, it says, that, and then he showed me a pure river of the water of life that flows in the middle of Of the street, and on either side is a tree of life. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. But many of you, maybe your eyes have fallen on verse 27, chapter 21. Verse 27 says, but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. There is an eternal 
destination for us if you know Jesus. But if you don't know Jesus, you're not welcome. It is the decision literally of a lifetime. What you're going to do with this person, Jesus. There is tons of, of evidence that Jesus was a real person. We have more evidence, by the way, that Jesus was a real person than that Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar lived. We have tons of information about Jesus, not just from the Bible, but from several non-Christian, non-believing people talking about Jesus. We know he was killed, not just from the Bible, but from several non-Christian, non-followers of Jesus. And we know there was an amazing thing that happened. I, I, I read a, a document, and I, I didn't write it down. I totally forget. Uh, but uh, what basically, it was a, maybe it was Pliny? The elder, maybe, I, I can't remember who it was. Um, but he wrote of darkness and an earthquake. And he was not a follower of Jesus. He was not a follower of the way. But he wrote of uh, darkness and an earthquake that happened at that time when Jesus died. I'll have to look that up if you're interested. If I can get that information for you. Um, there is a lot of evidence. There's a lot of people who have done deep investigation trying to disprove Christianity and Jesus Christ. Uh, rising from the... There's, People can try to bring up all kinds of contradictions and whatnot. But it's real. Jesus Christ lived approximately 2,000 years ago. He was born. He was raised. And he died on a cross for you, for me, so that we can, our final destination could be this place that's described in Revelation 21. So that we can spend eternity in the new heavens and the new earth with Jesus present on earth. No more crooked, rotten leaders of our countries. Jesus will be the leader. We'll live in perfection. If you want that, if that's something that you don't have, I'm, I'm, I'm ending here. If that's something that you're interested in, Jesus wants your heart. Jesus wants your life. It's not just a, okay, I'll add Jesus to my plethora of things that I believe in. It's not. It's I'm going to get rid of everything else, and I'm going after Jesus. With all of my life, I'm all in. It's none of this side of the pool and dipping your toe in. It's... I would have jumped in, but I'm getting feedback. <laughs> um, it's jumping all in. Jump all in. That's what Jesus wants. And if you haven't jumped all in, today might be the day you jump all in. Christmas is a special time of year because this Savior is, we celebrate his birth. As a kid growing up, it was all about presents and food. As an adult who knows Jesus, it's about Jesus and food. <laughs> Jesus is my very reason to live. I hope he's your reason to live. If he's not your reason to live, please when I come up to do the benediction, I'm going to invite you to come join us and, and for prayer. And I want you to seriously, if you're, if God is pulling you, please come forward and uh, let us pray with you. Father God, I praise you for this message and for your love and, and for all that you do for the mission of, of, 
ultimately saving and recreating a final destination for us, your servants. In Jesus' name, amen.